say welcome. Great to have you here with us today. Uh, if we haven't met before, I'm Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at C3. And I uh, want to welcome you here in person in this venue and also in the North venue and those that are online today. We're so glad that you're with us today. Uh, here's what we're doing. Today we are continuing our series that we're calling uh, Awkward Family Christmas. And today we're talking about label makers. And I want to uh, kind of give you a, a probably a word picture that you probably already know and see if you can finish it. Uh, sticks and stones will break my bones, but, but words will never hurt me. Can I tell you that is a flat out lie? That is a flat out lie, right? <clears throat> because words do hurt us. In fact, uh, this last week, getting ready for, for the message today, uh, I put on social media um, this week asking people, saying, tell me what horrible things or bad things that people have said to you. And within just a couple hours, I had like over 100 uh, C3ers respond. And, and then we took it down because I thought it was just way too much. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not going to read 100 and some, but I want to share some of these things uh, that people, C3ers, maybe you here in, in person or online, uh, was one of these responses. I'm just going to give you a handful. And, and at times I said, uh, would you also tell me who said this? Now, they, it could be a parent, it could be a teacher, whatever. But uh, not everybody said who said it to them, but they know in clarity what was said to them. So here's, here's a few of them. One of them is a, a lady named Alice, and she said uh, when she was a kid or a teenager, um, she was called Dumb Old Ugly Alice, and the person that would always tell her that was her mother. Uh, boy, that's a Mother of the Year award right there, isn't it? It's amazing when you hear things like this. And we're just getting started. Um, there's uh, another one that said uh, she, they were called a witch. Didn't say who said that, if it was a parent or what, but it was a witch. Um, I was told I belonged in the back of a garbage truck. Wow. You would be pretty if you lost some weight. Who said that? My sister. I was told I was fat, ugly, and smell like a wet dog. Who said that? My classmates at school. I was called white trash and stupid. You're stupid, said my mom. You're worthless and shouldn't be alive, said my dad to me, his son. Wow. I can't even imagine and I'm so glad that I don't have to imagine this. But, I, but some of you probably actually had a father like that. You, you shouldn't even be alive. We're going to talk about this. These are labels that people give to us. You're, you're worthless and you shouldn't be alive. You're worthless and a loser, said my mom. You're a whore. I wish you died in childbirth. Now, the person didn't say who said that, but I'm inferring that's probably a father or a mother that said that to them. I wish you died in childbirth. You're dumb. You could be beautiful if you weren't so fat, said my mother-in-law. Way to go, mother-in-law. Good job. That's awesome. Yeah. I wish your house would burn down with you and your wife in it, said my mom to me, adult son. I wish your house would burn down with you and your wife in it. Amazing. You're fat and ugly and nobody wants you, said my dad. Can I tell you that the majority of the things that I'm reading to you right now that are true, that, they, that they've told me, was from childhood and teenagers. This are, these are people that are adults. Decades later, in clarity, are remembering what was said to them and who said it to them. You're an idiot, said my mom. I never wanted you, said my mom. In high school, one of my advisors told me I'd never be smart enough to go to college or make anything of myself. My advisor told me I should just get used to being a, quote, stupid nobody. That is somebody that should not work with children. <clears throat> As a child, I was told that I was too ugly to play with other kids. And I'll give you this one last one. These other ones that I've told you was what people said specifically to this person. This last one I've saved for you is <clears throat> not about the person. It's about somebody that they know. And this is what they wrote. 
<clears throat> my friend on social media was getting bullied. Individuals told my friend that they wished that she would have gone through committing suicide when she previously attempted it. In other words, people on social media are saying, ah, you should have just killed yourself. You didn't do it, but try it again. Can I tell you, these are labels that we oftentimes hear as we were a kid or as a, a teenager. We hear these things, and for some reason, we apply it and think, well, they must know. My mom and dad must know. Maybe I am a nobody. Maybe I shouldn't have lived through childbirth. Maybe, all these, we take these things on. And I'm going to give you a phrase <clears throat> that if you're a regular C3-er, we have talked about this. I've said this phrase many times in many services, but it is pertinent for today. And it's this. Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. You maybe have been hurt, but where did the hurt come from? It might be from your siblings. It might be from a friend. It might be from your parents. Why would they say horrible things, give you a label like that? It's because probably somebody hurt them first. And so hurt people hurt people. But yet somewhere the cycle has to stop. And I want to give you a verse today that I want you to really consider and think about. There are some verses in the Bible where you kind of scratch your head and you're like, oh, what does that mean? But then there's some verses that are just like perfectly clear. And this is one of them. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life. Isn't this what God tells us? God gives us life. You're not a nobody. You're a somebody. You are a child of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. I have come to die and pay the penalty for your sin because I think you're worth it. God speaks life to us. Life and death. Now, what is death? I wish you died in childbirth. You're fat. You're ugly. I wish your house would burn down with your family in it. That's death talk. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. What we say matters. Some of you probably had some of these hurtful things that I just read said to you. And maybe the person who said it to you was kind of even joking. <laughs> Man, they're just kind of laughing and going, yeah, you're never going to get married because you're too ugly and too fat. And they kind of said it like jokingly, but it wasn't funny. And it hurt and it cut, and you decades later still remember it. And you've carried this label around with you. And the interesting thing is, we have Christmas coming up now. And people will sometimes gather for, together for Christmas. And what happens when your family gathers together for Christmas? For some reason, you start kind of reminiscing about different things in the past, and somebody will start bringing up some of these things again. And you're like, that was years ago, and all of a sudden now it's being brought up again this Christmas. Wow. Wow. It just keeps going on and on and on. Hurt people hurt people, but we can stop the cycle because life and death and the power of tongue, what we say matters. We'll, I want you to think to yourself, which one of these do you usually speak to people? Do you speak life to people or do you speak more death to people? I'm going to say from what I've read here and all the other ones that I didn't read, and let me tell you, there were some that I could not read to you because I would have to totally re-edit it, the things that were said that people told me about. I'm going to tell you, our world speaks death. God speaks life, and if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are to do what Jesus did. We are to speak life as well. But for some reason... When people have hurt us, we want to hurt others. Hurt people hurt people. See, make sure you don't label people. Make sure you don't label people like others did to you. Don't do that. Don't label people like that. Make the cycle stop. Make the cycle, make, make, make the cycle stop with you. You can be the one that can stop it. You don't have to be speaking death like other people speak, spoke to you. You can start speaking life to them, encouraging other people. Speak life, not death. Think about your words. 
Think about what I'm about to say to this person. Would I want somebody to say that to me? If, if we would want it said to us, then why in the world would we say it to somebody else? But what happens oftentimes when we're a kid or a teenager or a young adult, somebody says something to us, and we think, well, because they're a friend, because they're a sibling, because they're a parent, they must know. And so we, we take what we've heard on the outside about us, and we internalize it inside. And we believe that that's probably really what we are. People say things, you're like, you're lazy, you're fat, you're useless, you're stupid, you're broken, you're a junkie. And these are labels that people love to make themselves feel better to tear other people down. But can I tell you, God comes to change the label. God comes to change the label. You see, when you think, when, think about Jesus, when he came, he came with a label. His label was sacrifice. That's what he came to be, is a sacrifice for you and for me to take away all these labels, all these this hurts, these pains, these sins that we've all had. He's come to sacrifice himself so that we can have a new label. So what, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say when old labels are, ru are, are ruining your life and even your holidays? Some of you are like, you know that some of those things are going to come up at the holidays when you have family over. They're going to be talking about what you did when you were a kid and stuff, and it's like it's going to be like being stabbed again. What does the Bible say when old labels are ruining your life and even, even Christmas? Well, let me give you the first thing. First thing is this. Words are powerful. We cannot deny that. Words are powerful. In fact, let me just tell you, in the very beginning of the Bible is Genesis. And in Genesis, what happens is God... God creates the world, God creates the universe, God creates everything. And how did he do that? By speaking, by his words. God spoke things into existence. Words are powerful. And I'm going to tell you, it's not just God's words, it's our words as well. In fact, let me give you a little story in the Bible. In Genesis... In Genesis, uh, there, there is a guy named Isaac, and he has two sons, and one of his sons is named Jacob. Jacob literally means, in that language, <clears throat> literally means deceiver. So how would you like to have your name be deceiver? That's an awesome name. Hey, my mom and dad call me deceiver. Well, it seemed to be poetic because later on in life, he actually did deceive his twin brother. And he was so afraid after he deceived his twin brother that he thought his brother was going to kill him. And so he took off and, and ran and got away from him. And then, and as I've told you before, some, in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, there are some crazy stories in there. And in, in Genesis 32, Genesis chapter 32, I'd highly recommend this to you. Uh, Jacob, who is known as Deceiver, literally, this is one of those crazy stories, literally, Jacob, who is known as Deceiver, wrestled with God. God showed up, and there was like a wrestling match. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. Who, I mean, you have to know the Bible's true, because who would put that in there if it's a lie? It has to be true. So he's wrestling literally with God. And what happens is later, God changes Jacob's name from deceiver, and he changes his name to a new label, a new name, Israel. You're no longer deceiver, you're Israel. So that gets a name change. And then all of a sudden we see this. Jacob, who was known as deceiver, who is now Israel, he's gotten married and his wife is giving birth. And in birth she is dying, she's bleeding to death. And she knows that she is dying as she's giving birth. And as she is giving birth, before she dies, she names her son. And she names her son this, son of my sorrows. <laughs> How would you like to have that name? Huh? Hey, what's your name? Oh, I'm Son of Sorrows. Oh, nice to meet you, Son of Sorrows. Yeah. That's the name that she gave him because she knew she was dying because of him being born. And here we see, here we see Jacob, who used to be called Deceiver, but God now calls him Israel. He looks at his son after his wife dies and says, you are not going to be Son of Our Sorrows. We're going to call you 
Benjamin, which means son of my blessing. And all of a sudden, what we see is two family generations changed. One was deceiver, one a son of sorrows. All of a sudden, deceiver becomes Israel, and son of sorrows becomes son of my blessing. You see, God wants to do the same thing for you and me. God wants to take these old labels and give us new labels. God wants us to say, yeah, those horrible things that were said to you, that's the past. I'm going to make your future new. I'm going to make it better. See, this is, this is what God's called us to do. This is what God promised to do. In fact, let me give you 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, say it with me, what? New creation. The old has passed away. The old has passed away. And see, the new has come. Now, keep the verse here for a second. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Anyone in Christ means this. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Not just that you believe that there's a God. Because as we've said this over and over, many times at C3 here, is that, is that even the devil believes there's a God. But he's not going to have an eternity with God. Do you know Christ? Not just know about him. Know Christ. Do you know him? Have you accepted him as Lord of your life and Savior of your soul? If so, then guess what? Then you are in Christ and you are now a new creation to which some of you will say, I don't feel like I'm a new creation. I feel like I was just before I came to come to know Christ. But the reality is this. You are a new creation. It's not mean that everything has changed now. It's where this is God is starting. And through the rest of your life, he's going to continue to make this new creation happen within you. It starts here once you come into a relationship with Christ. The old has passed away. All those labels, all those things, your parents, your friends, the teachers, whatever said to you, those are gone. You, you maybe took them on, but God's going, no, that's past. That's past. The new has come. You are my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. I died for you. I love you more than anything else. When the heavenly father asked me, hey, we need somebody to go down there and die. And pay, I, Jesus just jumped out of heaven to land to earth and said, I'll do it. Willing to give his life for you and for me. That's what he, he speaks life to us, not death. Did you know that you're going to get a new name? Let me show you in Revelation. In Revelation, God says this. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. But then he also says this. We'll also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. At some point, and then times is telling, me, telling us, God is going to change our name. And it's going to be a name that's going to be fitting for us, that's going to lift us up, that's going to encourage us, that's going to bring life to us, not death. Son of my sorrows, wow, what a great name. But Israel called him, no, you're the son of my blessing. Lifting us up, encouraging and helping us. What can we learn about God from all this? What can we learn from God about this? Well, God is in the business. God is in the business of creating new people with new identities and new names. Did you know that? God is in the business of creating new people with new identities and new names. We already see in some here in names from what we saw in Scripture, but new identities. Everything is going to change. God is taking us. We are becoming new. He's changing everything once we come into that relationship with God. Now, some of us, he's changing faster. Some of us, he's changing slower because we're kind of slower in our relationship with God. But God is changing, creating, making new our identities and our names. What can we learn about ourselves? Well, here's what we can learn about ourselves. What we can learn about ourselves, this is God is rewriting your story. Did you know that? At this moment, at this time, God is rewriting your story. The people that you've dealt with in the past, they've been writing your story in a negative way. They've put you down. They've said horrible things like some of the things that I just read about these other people. They've been reading, the, they've been saying these things, but the reality is this. 
God is rewriting your story. And can I, can I encourage you in telling you something? Your story dovetails into God's story. You see, Jesus' story is that he is God. And he left heaven to die for you and I. And how your story is being rewritten to become part of his story is that you are one of the ones that he has died for. Yes, for the whole world, but forget that. He would have done it specifically for you. Because he loves you. He loves me that much. That he would be willing to do it. So God is rewriting your story to include his story. And the story is the king leaves his palace and comes down to the peasants and gives his life for them because he loves us. And he wants a relationship, not, not just now, but for all eternity. This is what he's done. And he's rewriting the story for you and for me. And can I just show you some other people in Scripture? I could, I could spend the rest of the day telling you people in Scripture. But I'm just going to give you a few examples of people who had uh, one, one label, but then Jesus changed the label. So let me give you a couple. One of them is uh, Simon, Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot, uh, he had a label that was uh, basically potential murderer. Why? Because he wanted to kill people who worked for the Romans, especially Jews that were working for the Romans. So a zealot would be a Jew, and they hated their other Jews that were working for the Romans. And they would beat them up, they would hurt them, and sometimes they would even murder them. Jesus comes along knowing that this guy is very um, over the top, let's just say. And Jesus comes along, and he gives him a new title, a new label, and it's disciple. Now, if I'm Jesus, and I'm looking for some disciples, I don't know if I'm going to ask this guy, right? Because this guy could be, you know, a hothead. This guy could be re just ready for a fight any moment. But yet Jesus gives him a new name, disciple. Let me give you another one, Moses. Moses, maybe you know a little bit more about Moses. But Moses had the label murder because literally he did murder. He was, he was in Egypt, and there was an Egyptian that was getting ready to kill, to a, uh, kill a Jew, and, and Moses saw that, and he stopped the, the Egyptian, and he killed him, and the next day it came out that Moses was the one who killed him. And so he literally, Moses literally was a murderer. But God gave him a new name. God gave him the name Prophet. But beyond Prophet, he also gave the name Leader. Because all of a sudden you see... After Moses goes back, Moses says, hey, I want all of the Jews to be released. I don't want us to be here in Egypt. I don't want us to have to be able to be all the workforce and everything. We are not your slaves anymore. Let our people go. God gave him prophet as a new name, leader as a new name. Let me give you another one. Oh, my goodness. Listen to this one. Talking about David, and specifically King David in the, in the first half of the Bible, which is the Old Testament. King David is a huge figure in the Old Testament. And King David literally had two labels, murderer and adulterer. He was a king, and uh, one time he saw a woman that was married, and he had an affair with her. And her husband wasn't there because he was out at the war that the king wanted him to be at. Uh, long story short, the husband comes home. He gets the king, King David, kills the, the husband and then takes his wife. So here is King David murdering a husband and taking the wife. <laughs> I want you to stop and think for a moment. What is the worst thing? You don't have to say it out loud. Please don't say it out loud. But what is the worst thing you have ever done? Think about it in your mind. What is the worst thing you have ever done? Studies tell us that if you have a room of 200 people or more, every known sin to man is in that room, including murder. We have that right here today. There are some of you, possibly, that have killed somebody. Maybe it, maybe it was in a war, maybe it was in something else. I don't know. But I'm looking at this murder, adultery, it's like, you know, that's a ticket south. You know, you're not going to heaven. You're going the other way, right? Hope you like the heat. That's what I'm thinking. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, David 
David, who was a murderer and adulterer, you know what God did? God gave him a whole new name. God gave him a whole new label. And here was it. He says, he's a man after God's own heart. And I'm like, what? He, he was a murderer and an adulterer. But later in Scripture, God says that, that David was a man after God's own heart. No matter the worst thing you've ever done, it can give you a whole new label. You think you're worthless. Maybe you haven't killed anybody. Maybe you haven't had an affair, but you've done something really bad. And you think, God can't forgive me. If he can forgive David for murdering and adultering and say that he's a man after God's own heart, God can say the same for you. God can change that label from the, light, from the death talk to the life talk. He'll spring, he brings life into you because the tongue has life and death, and God always speaks life. Whew. Let me give you a couple more. Levi. Levi, he was a thief because he stole money. He was a tax collector, and then he'd inflate it, and he'd take the rest for himself. So he was literally a thief. That was his label. Everybody knew it. But you know what happened? Jesus comes along. And Jesus gives him a whole new name, disciple. Do you remember that guy I said earlier, Simon the Zealot, who hated Jews that were helping uh, the Romans? That's what Levi was doing. Levi was a Jew, and he was helping the Romans by taking the money and giving it to them. And here, Jesus goes, hey, I think it'd be good to put Levi and Simon the Zealot together as disciples. That'll be interesting. Who would do that? I mean, I would be afraid if I was Jesus. I'd be afraid that I'd be always watching Simon the Zealot because he's probably got a knife just ready to kill Levi, right? But for some reason, Jesus goes, no, it's going to work. And it did. Nowhere in Scripture does it ever say that those two guys were fighting. They never fought or had a problem that was ever in Scripture. God gives us a new name regardless of the past. God always gives us a new name. Let me give you one last one, Saul. After Jesus died on the cross and then rose again, and then 40 days later, he ascended heaven. We get into the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we meet Saul. Saul was a religious leader, but he did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, didn't believe with all, all that kind of stuff. So he had the label of persecutor because he was persecuting Christians. He wanted them to be arrested, but mainly he really wanted them to be killed. And then all of a sudden, it's an amazing story, he actually encounters Jesus. Even though Jesus has left the planet, Jesus encounters Saul and changes Saul. And all of a sudden, God changed his name from Saul to Paul and gave him the labels this, apostle and also father of the early church. A guy who's trying to persecute the church, trying to arrest people and kill people that were Christians, all of a sudden, God makes him a Christian and makes him become the father of the early church. How ironic. I love how God does things. You're trying to stop my church and preach again. I'm going to make you start churches. I love how God turns things upside down. I love it. See, this is what God loves to do. Take the negative, throw it away, and bring us something positive. This is what God has for us. The real, you is, the real you is yet to be revealed. The real you is yet to be revealed. In fact, let me give you a verse. Let me give you a verse. In Romans 8, in Romans 8, it says this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to do the underlined part. It says this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let me, let me word it differently. If God is for you, who can be against you? Stop and think about that. If God is for you specifically, who can be against you? Your parents? Your teacher? Your boss? The government? There's nobody better than God. If God is for you, who can be against you? The answer is nobody. They can try to come against you, but God is always first. God is the one that says, you know what? They can say what they want, but I'm going to tell you who you really are. You're a child of the one true king. I love you. I gave my life for you. That's how much I love you. See, he takes the old, throws it out, and the new comes. So what are we going to do about it? Well, let's talk about some past labels. 
past labels are this. God wants, God wants to redeem all the old labels and renew them. God wants to take all of your old labels. He wants to redeem them and rename them. God is bigger. Listen, God is bigger than your past. No matter what you've done in your past, God can redeem that. God is bigger than your past. People will say, you're insecure. God will say, no, you're confident in Christ. People will say, you're lazy. God will say, no, you're motivated by a calling. People will say, you're a cheater, you're a loser. God will say, no, you're, you're forgiven. People, people will say, you're, 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 you're transformed, you're, you're, you're broken, you're, you're, you're miserable, you're, you're just broken. And God say, no, you're healed. <laughs> I love that. People say you're despised. God will say you're loved. People say you're alone. God says, no, I'm always with you. You know, you hear the negative, the, the death talk that people tell us, but then God always brings life when he speaks. This is what we have to understand. What about some future labels? You don't get to choose. Listen. You don't get to choose what comes into your life, but you do get to choose how you react to it. You can't pick what's going to come into your life. You can't choose that, but you can choose how you're going to respond. You're going to choose how it's going to go. Philippians 1.6 says this. Philippians 1.6 says, The one who started a good work in you, that is God, will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. The one, God who started a good work in you, will stay with you. He will complete it. He's not going to get halfway done and go, forget it. You're, you're not worth it. He's not going to do that. He's going com to complete it. He's going to stay with you the whole time. He's making you like Jesus. That's your story. That's our story. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be like Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. God has your story written. Did you know that? God has your story written. And what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to walk in it. We are supposed to live it out. We are supposed to do it. Ephesians 2.10 says this. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. We are God's accomplishments. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are an accomplishment of God? Well, that's not what my parents told me. That's not what my teacher told me. That's what the kids at school didn't tell me. I mean, they didn't say those things. That's because people speak death. God speaks life. He speaks life. We are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do bad, good, no, good things. Good things. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. And we are to be like Jesus. God planned these good things to be the way that we or you personally live your life. That's what we're to do. See, the old labels are gone. God redeems those. He brings new labels to us. And again, you don't get to choose what goes into, comes into your life, but you do get to choose how you're going to react to it. Can I tell you God is re rewriting your story? And it's not done yet, but can I tell you it's going, I promise you, it's going to end Amazingly. Let's pray. Father, right now we pause. And Lord, I know that for some, this is a tough message because those that responded to my question on social media about hurtful things that they had as a kid, oh boy, they just came out in droves. And Lord, some of those people are here and some of the people that didn't even answer are thinking it right now. They, whether online or here in the building, they are thinking of things that were said to them when they were a kid or a student. And Lord, I pray this. I pray whatever those things were ever said to them that they have taken on and believe now for themselves, I pray, Lord, that you would take away all those negative things. You would take away those negative labels, and you would bring today the new, that you would bring healing and peace. Lord, I pray that they would hear the life words from you, not the death words from other people, the life words from you, because our tongue has the power of life and death. 
And you always speak life to us. You always call us to a better place. You always call us a son or a daughter. And you love us. And I'm so thankful that you are right now changing labels. And you're bringing healing where healing needs to be healed. And Father, today, there are even some people today right now online stream or right here in the room that need to know you. Not just know you, but to know you personally. Have a relationship with you. And so, Father, right now, for those that are coming to you for the first time, or maybe it's somebody that's coming back to you for the second time or the 20th time, Lord, I pray right now for each one to bow their heart. Dear God, take these labels away from me. Help me to know who I truly am in you. You are the king, the son of the most high God. And I am your son and your daughter. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that are making that decision right now that are coming into a relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that they would begin to feel your presence and they would realize that they now have a new label, a child of the one true king. And we celebrate that. In your amazing name.